Hey for the Wild community. I wanted to let you know that we had a follow-up call with Dr. Chad Hansen last night about the current fires raging in California right now. So stay tuned after the show and you'll be able to hear some extra questions with Dr. Chad Hansen. Now on to the show. In the era of climate change, and when we have such threats to biodiversity, we have to recognize that there is a growing consensus among the scientific community, nationally and globally, that in order to avert, in order to avoid the very worst effects of climate change, we need to not only move beyond fossil fuel consumption, we need to also dramatically increase forest protection and pull a bunch more CO2 out of the atmosphere. And that's the only way we're gonna get there. We cannot get to our climate change mitigation goals just by moving beyond fossil fuel consumption alone. We have to do that, but it's, it's necessary, it's not sufficient. We also have to protect our forests and increase forest protection. Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today we are speaking with Chad Hansen. Chad is a research ecologist with the John Muir Project of Earth Island Institute, located in Big Bear City, California. He is also a member of the Sierra Club's National Board of Directors, elected in 2018. Chad has a PhD in ecology from the University of California at Davis with a research focus on fire ecology in conifer forest ecosystems, and he is the co-editor and co-author of the 2015 book, Nature's Phoenix, The Ecological Importance of Mixed Severity Fires. Studies published by Dr. Hansen covers topics such as habitat selection of rare wildlife species associated with habitat created by high severity fire, post-fire conifer responses and adaptation, fire history, and current fire patterns. Well, welcome, Chad. We're so excited to speak with you today about all of this research and topics that you cover. Thank you. So I want to start off by speaking to the fact that indigenous peoples across Turtle Island have long tended fires to increase biodiversity, recognizing fire as being an actual vital part of ecosystems. However, dominant society today has a very different approach when it comes to the tending of fires and the stories that are told about them. This was glaringly apparent this past year as the mainstream news covered wildfires in the United States, emphasizing their presence as inherently catastrophic. So I'd like to begin this interview by inviting you to share some historical context on how we arrived at this point where dominant society insists on the quenching of fires and continues to perpetuate a serious cultural misunderstanding of fire? Well, that's a great question. You know, Native Americans have understood the importance of fire in forest ecosystems and other ecosystems for thousands of years in in North America. And um, there's a, a deep understanding there about the role of fire in creating certain types of vegetation, uh, producing and maintaining Uh, certain types of berry producing plants, trees that produce acorns and food, uh, creating habitat that large mammals prefer that might be good for hunting. Uh, This has been understood for a very, very long time. So, you know, for for many, many thousands of years, millions of years, actually, uh, fires occurred on in the forests of of North America and around the world. And with regard to the last several thousand and more years, um, Native Americans have started fires and st- fires have been started by lightning. And so, you know, in the, in the past, you know, 15,000 years and to the present in particular, you know, fire has been a combination of Native American burning and lightning strikes for a very, very long time. And, uh, and this, is, this is what the biodiversity in our forest depends on. There are many, many species in the forest, plant and animal, that actually can't survive without the habitat that's created, the unique habitat created by fire. But Really, in starting especially in the gold rush era, the uh, settlers viewed fire as something that destroyed what they saw as a timber commodity resource. And so they were really looking at the forest from an economic standpoint. And they saw fire as the enemy because it was killing something that they wanted to cut down and sell and use for lumber. Yes, I remember actually 
in my fire ecology class that I took a few years ago, we talked about Smokey the Bear. I think it's Smokey the Bear and just the rhetoric and even this cartoon story to get people to really protect the timber industry. And I think even it was maybe perhaps the timber industry that was behind Smokey the Bear, although I think it's also with the U.S. Forest Service. But again, the U.S. Forest Service sells contracts to timber companies. So it's really important for us to look at why this culture is trying to, quote unquote, protect against forest fires. And, and thank you for bringing that up. The next thought I was having was that, you know, I think about ponderosa pine and lodgepole pine, for example, and they've evolved over thousands of years to live in harmony with fire. Today, the cones pop open and set seeds through intense heat. And then I think about morel mushrooms, you know, they're another example in which heat stimulates the spreading of its spores. So I'd like to know what are some other examples of how high intensity fire patches support the highest levels of biodiversity in the Western United States? And how is this a part of the forest community really coming together and rebounding from fire? And I guess another question in that vein is, what happens to these ecosystems when humans intervene and try to suppress intense fires? Yeah, those are great questions. So in order to sort of get into that, we need to first, I think, dispel some of the common mythology about fires, especially large you know, wildland fires and high intensity fire patches, because we hear a lot of misinformation out there uh, in the public dialogue, a lot of it from politicians, uh, especially those who get a lot of campaign contributions from the logging industry. We also hear it from the United States Forest Service, especially under the Trump administration. As you mentioned, the U.S. Forest Service is in the commercial logging business. They sell public timber to private logging companies and, and they keep most of the revenue for their budget. So they, you know, they have a financial incentive. And, uh, and everything involved in this logging is sort of wrapped up in the, the fire issue. You know, basically, the, the proponents of logging on national forests and other forests are, are saying that they need to log the forests supposedly to curb fire and stop fire. And um, you know, it doesn't really work that way. You know, fire is driven mostly by weather, not by the density of the forest. And oftentimes, actually, the areas that have had the most logging tend to burn the hottest. So logging doesn't have that effect. But there's a deeper issue here that they're missing uh, with all that rhetoric. And, and that's that when fires burn, even in those patches where they burn hot and kill most or all the trees, the forest regenerates in spectacular fashion. And that regeneration creates wonderful wildlife habitat. You know, we hear a lot of uh, sort of hyperbolic statements out there that right now the forests are so dense and, they, and the fires burn so hot that it sterilizes the soil and nothing will grow. That's pure mythology. It doesn't work that way at all. And in fact, our forests are not more dense now than they were historically. Uh, actually, uh, there's less biomass in our forests now than there was a century ago because of decades of logging. And, and so, you know, there's a lot of mythology we kind of need to cut through on this. But I'll just talk about, you know, how it really works in the forest when fire burns. So, you know, the first thing that happens after the flames pass and the smoke clears is that there are uh, many, many species, native species of beetles, we call wood boring beetles. And they have evolved over many thousands of years. They've evolved receptors in their bodies to detect uh, fires by heat or by smoke, depending on the beetle species. And they will make a beeline for fire areas because they need recently fire killed trees in order to reproduce. So the beetles, they are really good flyers. They'll fly from, you know, from miles away and they'll land on the, the charred bark of a fire killed tree. They lay their eggs and the larva develops and bores through the bark into the wood of the fire killed tree. And it develops into an adult over the course of a year, two years, sometimes three or four years or more. And then it emerges as an adult. But when it's a larva inside these fire killed trees, uh, when it's in that stage, it's food uh, for a number of native woodpecker species that depend on the larva of these wood boring beetles in order to survive. And, uh, you know, dead trees are softer than live trees. And so the woodpeckers create nest cavities in these dead trees. So, for example, the blackback woodpecker, it's a species I've been studying for about 15 years now. Uh, it's a monogamous species. And every spring, the male will create between two and four nest cavities. And the female picks the one she likes the best, and that's where they raise their young that year. But all the other nest cavities that, that they don't use, those are available for all the other cavity nesting species in the forest 
that have to have cavities to reproduce and raise their young, but they can't make their own. So for example, bluebirds and nuthatches, wrens, flying squirrels, chipmunks, dozens and dozens of bird and small mammal species need these cavities, but they depend on the woodpeckers to create those cavities in these dead trees for them. And the woodpeckers can't do that unless they have dead trees and the beetle larvae to eat. You can't have that unless you have fire or cycles of drought that kill patches of trees as well. And so you end up having this very, very rich and interconnected ecosystem that provides food and habitat for all kinds of species. But the other thing that happens is shortly after a fire, especially where it burns hotter and kills more trees, is it stimulates the growth of all kinds of fire following plants that have evolved to depend on intense fire to basically spur their germination. And these are, you know, a lot of these are flower producing plants, wildflowers and flowering shrubs, and they attract uh, native flying insects. And that provides uh, food for fly catching birds and bats. And uh, the shrubs and the natural regeneration of conifer seedlings and oak seedlings that come in and uh, the dead trees that fall, all that understory vegetation and complexity provides great habitat for small mammals. And because of all the small mammals and all the birds in the forest, that also provides food for raptors, owls, and hawks. And uh, a lot of the berry producing plants are, are great for the bears to get fat on before the winter. And so you end up having uh, an ecosystem that uh, is incredibly biodiverse. And in fact, interestingly, the areas that burn hottest, where most or all the trees are killed, those patches that represent typically 20 to 25, sometimes 30 percent of the area that burns in a forest, those areas, we call that snag forest habitat, those areas that burn hotter. And that's actually comparable to old growth forest in terms of native biodiversity and wildlife abundance. So it's actually an ecological treasure, not a disaster. That is so interesting to really break down these myths and truly understand fires from an ecological standpoint. I, I want to get into that even more, but before we do... I'm wondering, is it beneficial or how beneficial is it to seed or plant trees after these high intensity fires? I'm wondering, does that speed up the process or is it more about that the high intensity fires uncover seeds that have been resting in the soil for long periods of time? You know, what is the best way to look at restoration of these burned areas if that's even beneficial at all? Right. So, so, you know, going back to your question earlier about, you know, what does it mean when humans intervene after fire? The bottom line is this, and basically hundreds of scientific studies have been published on these issues. And what they're really telling us loudly and clearly is that the best thing you can do after a fire is absolutely nothing from an ecological standpoint. Now, if you have a dead tree that could fall on a house, then you need to cut that dead tree down because that's a public safety issue. But from an ecological standpoint, uh, from purely forest ecology, you don't need to do anything. You don't need to replant. You don't need to cut trees down. Uh, the forest regenerates all on its own, just naturally. Even in the largest patches of high-intensity fire, the areas where dead trees, you know, you have nothing but dead trees across hundreds of meters of, of ground, those forests regenerate beautifully. And I just published a study on that, on that very issue. And the reason is it's not just about how close to a given area live trees are. It's also about the birds and the small mammals distributing seed source all over the forest. So, you know, in some cases, there are certain conifer species, certain tree species that depend on uh, intense fire to melt the resins in their cones and to release their seeds. Giant sequoia is one of those species. For example, Rocky Mountain Lodgepole pine, knobcone pine, there are a number of them. But there are also a lot of species that, that have other adaptations and they depend on intense fire or you know, even low and moderate intensity fire to create the conditions that allow new trees to regenerate. And, uh, and they regenerate beautifully. But the reality is this, is that in some places, the regeneration of the trees is going to be very, very dense and very quick. And in other places, it's going to be more open and it's going to be more oak and shrub dominated with more uh, scattered conifer trees regenerating. Both of those things are good. And that's, that's what we need to understand is there's, it's not a cookie cutter approach. In nature, you want that kind of variety. You want that what we call heterogeneity. And we get that after fire. We get these natural varied patterns of regeneration and that mosaic, uh, including in the biggest high intensity fire patches. 
And that's good because certain species want different things. And if you're just doing one type of thing, which is what they do when they, they cut down the fire killed trees and, and artificially plant trees in these post fire logging operations after fire, you know, they basically plant for 250 or 300 trees per acre. And what you get is a sterile, ecologically diminished area, basically a tree plantation. And um, it's really just a crop. It's not a forest ecosystem. You know, so basically what they've done is removed the forest. And I think what we need to get to is, is an understanding that a forest ecosystem is not just the areas of mostly gr live green trees that haven't burned in a long time or have burned more recently at low and moderate intensity where most of the trees survive. And that's what most fire is. Even the biggest fires are mostly low and moderate intensity, but there are significant high intensity fire patches. And the question is, what does that mean? And, uh, you know, we have to understand that, you know, now there are hundreds of scientific studies that are telling us those high intensity fire patches create another forest habitat type that wasn't recognized historically. This is what we call snag forest habitat. And it's just as important as old growth forest in terms of, you know, wildlife uh, diversity and, and abundance. And we need to recognize that. And so it's not a matter of restoring the forest after the fire. It's a matter of recognizing that the fire actually is the restoration. To hear that after a fire, there's a plethora of biodiversity as much or close to an old growth forest. It's really interesting to wrap my mind around that concept. And I guess part of me is thinking, okay, a high severity fire is a large disturbance. And that disturbance actually, like you were saying, creates biodiversity. But how does that differ from, let's say, clear cutting, which is also a large disturbance? You know, I know in a sense, yeah, there won't be the snags, but I'm, I'm trying to see like how to explain this question that's coming up in my mind is, so if, if large high severity fires are creating disturbance that creates ecological diversity, but clear cutting is also a large disturbance, but destroys biodiversity, could you kind of explain the difference between the two? I know that may seem really simple, but there's... I don't know. There's something in that question that feels important. It is. It's actually a very good question. And I think it's, it's important because in the 20th century, foresters, uh, the logging industry, the Forest Service, they basically equated an area that burned at high intensity in a fire with a clear cut. They would call it early successional or early sterile forest. And scientifically, we now know that that is completely wrong. Nothing could be further from the truth. The two conditions are completely opposite and bear no relationship to each other. And I'll explain why. In a fire, as I said, you know, in most areas, even in the biggest fires, mostly what they are is low and moderate intensity, where you have most of the live mature trees survive. 
but you have patches that can represent 10% of the total fire area, sometimes 30 or 40%, but usually in that 20, 25% range that are high intensity fire. And those areas uh, are basically dominated by fire killed trees, what we call snags, those standing dead trees, and also all of the understory vegetation that grows in the shrubs, the oaks, the conifer regeneration uh, in, in different ways in different locations. When you have a clear cut that removes all of that structure, all of that habitat, and all you have is just rows of planted trees, little trees grown in nurseries, planted all the same age. You don't have the things that wildlife need to survive and reproduce. So, you know, as I mentioned, a forest ecosystem is not just mature green trees. That's one of about six or seven key structural components of a forest ecosystem. To have a forest and to have all the biodiversity in the forest, you also need the small understory trees, the oaks, the conifers, the dogwoods, the aspens. You also need the, the dead trees, the, the snags. You need the down logs. You need the shrubs and the wildflowers. What clear cutting does is it removes all of that. And frankly, what, what thinning does, what people hear, they hear the word thinning a lot, and you know, they think of it as the Forest Service out there with pruning shears. But in reality, thinning is a very, very intensive and very damaging industrial logging operation the vast majority of the time. And they're removing, killing and removing upwards of 70% of the trees in a given stand, including mature and old growth trees. And basically what you have in those mechanical thinning areas is just these kind of widely spaced live mature trees, but almost nothing else. The understory is basically gone. The snags are mostly gone. The down logs are gone. The shrubs are gone. And so, you know, especially in clear cutting, but also to a large extent in these areas that where, where mechanical thinning has occurred, most of what actually defines a forest ecosystem has been removed. Whereas in a fire, especially in those patches where it burns hot, you actually have creation of a particular type of habitat, a unique habitat, this snag forest that is very structurally complex and has all these different habitat elements, the snags, the down logs, the regenerating conifer seedlings and saplings, the pockets and patches of, of native shrubs uh, that the shrub nesting birds and the small mammals like so much, the patches of, of snags that the woodpeckers uh, and all the cavity nesters need. All of that is there. And, and so that's why it's so rich in biodiversity. But, but a clear cut is, uh, is basically the act of removing all of that habitat. And so, you know, honestly, from an ecological standpoint, a clear cut is closer to a parking lot than it is to a patch of snag forest created by high intensity fire. Thank you so much for explaining the difference between those two things, because although I understood, you know, somewhere in my mind that they are very different, I think that, again, there's a lot of rhetoric about how they're somewhat similar. And it's really interesting to hear the complexities of the myths that were told, especially around thinning. And thinning has been this question mark in my mind for so long because in a sense, I hear you had said that there's actually less biomass in the forest now, but in a sense, they're more crowded because of the way that timber companies have replanted plantation forests. Like instead of, you know, and I always imagine it, instead of looking at a forest or a plantation as a forest is almost like a field of corn, but it's just usually dug furs instead of a corn crop. And that absolutely has very little biodiversity. Much of the time, those clear cuts are actually poisoned with insecticides and fungicides and trying to kill other plants out so that the crop tree, usually the dug fir conifer, the ponderosa pine, the sitka spruce, cedar, um, will grow back. So it's it's a really interesting investigation to start looking into when you really start seeing the truth behind large-scale logging operations. And and I want to get into that more, especially with the politics behind it. But before we go there, I wanted to talk a bit more about some of the impacts of fires. So I think about the general consensus is that predicted future climates will greatly increase fire frequency. So we're really looking at more fires, you know, the extent, the severity, and I have a few questions here of like, one, I'm wondering, how will this change common vegetation? Will areas traditionally dominated by, say, shrubland and chaparral transition to grasslands? 
you know, how will this change impact species composition in areas like California? And then I think a second part to that question is the question of drought and how drought, which is most likely eminent in the near future, and I mean, we're already in it, especially in places like California, and honestly, the whole Pacific Northwest, how is drought going to affect regrowth after fires? Does it become increasingly difficult for the earth to regenerate during periods of drought? Yeah, all good questions. So I mean, I think to have a, a good conversation about the influence of climate change and fire, we really need to kind of decouple those two things. Because climate change influences fire, of course, and it's influencing it right now, and it will continue to do that. At the same time, they have very, very different effects because the main threat from climate change, in my view, is rising temperatures. And that can cause shifts in vegetation patterns, and it can cause shifts in patterns of where vegetation grows, where it regenerates. And oftentimes, the fire and climate change get conflated into the same conversation. They really need to be treated separately because what I'm seeing is that when fires are occurring, you're getting this wonderful regeneration, this rejuvenation of the forest ecosystem and, and other ecosystems, woodlands and grasslands, lots of different ecosystem types, but especially forests. And if anything, I'm actually seeing fire as an agent of maintaining vegetation types in a given area and rejuvenating those stands. I see the threat from climate change, from human-caused climate change, to our forests as being primarily about rising temperatures and, and possibly as well drought cycles related to climate change. But a couple of things need to be understood in this, in this context. First of all, we have a substantial deficit of fire in our forests currently. And that's not something that most people understand. I mean, it's well understood within the scientific community. It's not well understood among the general public or among policymakers. But this is an interesting thing because the fact is, is that there is no dispute in the scientific community about that fact. What people disagree about, what they debate all the time, what they fight about is how much less fire we have now than we had historically. Is it half as much? Is it one seventh as much? Uh, is it somewhere in between? But there's a broad consensus that we have a deficit of fire and basically a deficit of all intensities, low, moderate and high in our conifer forest ecosystems. So we need to understand that because the reality is, from an ecological standpoint, we don't want too much fire and we don't we don't want too little. Right now, we actually have too little. So there are a number of models that are predicting that we'll have more fire in the future uh, because of human-caused climate change, because of increasing temperatures, which can influence fire, because of drought cycles, which can, can influence fire. There are other climate models that predict it's going to be a complex mix of regional or localized increases and localized or regional decreases in fire because of the combination of rising temperatures in some areas in combination with drier conditions and rising temperatures in other areas in combination with wetter conditions. So whether you have hotter, drier conditions or warmer, wetter, that makes a big difference in terms of what you can expect uh, with, with regard to future fire effects. Uh, so we may get a complex mix. There are a number of studies predicting that. And there are other models that are predicting widespread decreases in fire, especially high intensity fire. Uh, in the future, even if we might have a short term increase in the, the, the near near term decades, overall, it'll decrease. And they're predicting that in a hotter, drier future on the basis of predicted shifts in understory vegetation with ongoing droughts and uh, basically less understory vegetation to carry flames. And, um, you know, honestly, we're not going to know until we, we get there in the future, which is why it's so important to continue to publish studies on existing trends, where where things are going right now, where they've gone since uh, 1984, which is our earliest data from satellite imagery that allows us to track fires and fire intensity. And I've published some work on this and I'll continue to do that. So it's really important that we actually publish information on the, ex the actual existing trends and patterns. What we're seeing from those is that we have an overall incremental increase in the annual acres burned. So the total area that burns in fire in a given year is sort of incrementally increasing and has been for a number of decades. We still have a lot less now than we had historically, but it is increasing. But interestingly, what uh, the great majority of the, the studies, including my own, uh, show is that fire intensity is not going up. 
So even as the area that burns in a given year is starting to get inch by inch uh, every year, a little closer to historical norms that occurred before fire suppression, the fires are not getting more intense, which was one of the you know, biggest concerns or fears for a long time that if, if fire increases, it's going to increase also in intensity. But we're not seeing that. Uh, we need to keep looking at it, though. Just to go back to the thought of, and, and, and maybe we can't answer this right now, but do you think that drought is going to affect the regrowth after fires? Is that something that you're concerned about? Or do you think that it's just part of evolution and these seeds and shrubs and trees will find another way to capture water? Because I, I think about, well, potentially after a fire, the soil could maybe even retain more water, kind of thinking about the whole biochar effect. But I also, you know, I, I'm, I wonder about that. As temperatures get hotter, drought gets more permanent, how will it affect the regrowth after a fire? Yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think drought can certainly have an effect on forest growth and forest regeneration. I don't think it's an issue of before or after a fire or whether or not a fire has occurred in a given area or not. I don't think that's the key issue. I think it's, it's rising temperatures from human caused climate change and possibly exacerbated drought cycles as a result of that, that will affect vegetation and regeneration across ecosystems and across forest types, whether they've burned or not. And that's really what I'm getting at is I think yeah. what we are concerned about is our shifts in forests upslope and north as a result of increasing temperatures in particular, but also possibly made worse by more intense drought cycles. Now, we've always had droughts and we've always had we've we've had big droughts. Um, you know, if you go back in the, the paleo ecological record, there are lots of studies on this showing we've had you know very, very long droughts, um, sometimes lasting for many years, sometimes decades, sometimes even longer. So that's not a new thing droughts or big droughts. The, the question is the frequency of them and the, and the duration. Will that, will that increase beyond historical norms? You know, there's always that possibility and there's a lot of data that still needs to be gathered on that. But uh, there's certainly a number of, of scientists that are predicting that climate change can make drought cycles worse. That is an issue that, is, that poses challenges, risks, and threats to forest ecosystems and other vegetation without regard to whether they've burned recently or not. With regard to fire, there's a few things that happen in fire that, that are different from areas that haven't burned in a long time. One of those things is nutrient cycling. And basically what that means is fire takes all of those twigs and branches and pine needles and leaves on the forest floor that have enormous amounts of important nutrients in them that are locked up in basically unusable forms in that, uh, in that woody material on the forest floor, what we call duff and litter. And fire, especially patches of more intense fire, they turn that into a nutrient-rich bed of mineral ash. And that rich bed of, of mineral ash spurs the growth of the forest for decades uh, to come after a fire occurs. So it's really important to understand that because, again, what I'm seeing right now is that we're seeing significant and very vigorous forest regeneration of conifers, of oaks, of shrubs, of all kinds of vegetation in these areas that are burned, including in the largest fires and even in the interior areas of the largest high intensity fire patches, such as those in the Rim Fire uh, that burned five years ago uh, west of Yosemite. It's a place I'm doing a lot of research and I published a study on post-fire regeneration in the Rim Fire uh, earlier this year. And what I found was that the regeneration happened I studied the regeneration in the most severe drought years after the, the rim fire occurred. And I studied in particular the largest high intensity fire patches. And what I found is that there, all of these areas are regenerating. I can't find a single acre where the conifer forest is not regenerating in these large high intensity fire patches, so long as they have not been subjected to post fire logging, which I'll talk about in a minute. But if, if it's natural regeneration, just left to nature, what I'm seeing is very, very dense, very rapid regeneration nearer to the uh, live tree edges, basically the low and moderate intensity areas where you mostly have live trees. So closer to those areas, it's, it's uh, somewhat denser. It's, uh, there's more fir and cedar trees. In the interior areas, farther away from live trees, 
in these bigger high intensity fire patches, we're getting conifer and oak regeneration too, but it's a little bit more open, which certain wildlife species really like, and it's more pine dominated. So it's possible that drought has, has played a role there because uh, those were very significant drought years uh, right after the fire occurred. It's also possible these are conifer species that have evolved to sort of take advantage of those spaces. You know, you get more fir and cedar closer to live trees and you get more pine dominated uh, regeneration deeper in the interior of those high intensity fire patches, more open pine dominated, pine and oak dominated forest. And, um, you know, to me, that's all to the good because, like I said, different groups of species like different things and depend on different things. Some like those open pine oak forests. Some like the really dense fir and cedar dominated forests. And you're getting all of that in the regeneration in the rimfire. These are action points for this episode, Myths and Mismanagement of Wildland Fires. One, call your state's U.S. Senators and Congressional Representatives at the Capitol Switchboard, 202-224-3121, and ask them to, one, keep the appropriation bill and the farm bill clean, keep all logging provisions off these two bills, and oppose any logging riders on these bills. Specifically, ask them to keep the Forest Resilience Bill, or H.R. 2936, off of the Farm Bill reauthorization. Two, ask them to support an end to any logging on national forest and commit publicly to saying that they are in support of ending logging on national forest. If you live in or near a wildfire zone, learn about defensible space. One, keep your chimney clean and screened. Two, keep your storage shed located away from your home. Three, avoid outdoor burning. Recycle mulch and compost when possible. Four, make sure your driveway is accessible and your address is visible. Five, scatter trees within 30 feet of your housing structure. Six, have 100 feet of garden hose attached. Seven, keep wood pile, fuel tanks, and other burnable materials 30 feet away from your housing structure. Eight, thin and prune conifer trees. Nine, keep grass green and mowed if it's within 30 feet. Keep vegetation mowed within 100 feet of your housing structure. Learn more at readyforwildfire.org backslash prepare dash for dash wildfire backslash. Our third action point is the John Muir Project encourages more birders. This is from their website. Did you know that most logging happens during nesting season? We need birders who will fight to document bird nest and occupancy in burned forests before these areas are devastated by logging. We want to use the weapon of information about the diversity and abundance of avian species in these areas to educate the public and the Forest Service on the true biodiversity cost associated with post-fire, aka salvage logging. Please sign up today and start helping to preserve species by making their presence known. Learn more at johnmuirproject.org backslash get dash involved backslash. Lastly, join the John Muir Project's mailing list to stay up to date on the fight to preserve our national forest at johnmuirproject.org. I really appreciate your perspective on this. It's such a complicated issue, especially when we mix climate change, drought, industrial scale logging, fires. It's a lot to take in and I really appreciate you breaking it down for us. I want to now talk about this forest carbon plan and following the wildfires in California this past year, Governor Jerry Brown announced this forest carbon plan, which proposed to use $254 million to double logging levels in California forest to at least 500,000 acres a year. So can you share with us why these sort of logging proposals actually leave communities more vulnerable to fires? You know, you've talked about how they harm forest ecosystems and could potentially even accelerate climate change, but also how do they strengthen the logging industry and threaten existing environmental protections? Well, there's there's a few different things going on here. And, you know, first off, uh, yeah, there are serious scientific problems with the Brown administration's forest carbon plan. It's it's not a scientifically sound document, to put it mildly. There are 
dozens and dozens of scientific studies that we submitted to the administration and other scientists, other organizations that they completely ignored. They misrepresented uh, numerous scientific studies that were cited, cited in the document. And what it all stands for is this, is basically they're proposing a massive increase in logging supposedly to maintain more carbon in our forests. Now, this is completely contradicted by the overwhelming weight of scientific evidence, which indicates that if you remove a bunch of carbon from the forest through logging, guess what? You have less carbon in the forest. You don't actually result in a net increase in forest carbon. Even if you assume that, uh, that the forest management activities that they're doing will curb fire, which it oftentimes doesn't do. But even if you make that assumption, a given area that's logged is so unlikely to burn within 15 or 20 years, there's very, very little chance that a, an area with, for example, mechanical thinning will even encounter a fire. And so these areas get mechanically thinned again and again and again every 15 or 20 years. And that can happen for 200 years before you even have a 50-50 chance of that stand even encountering fire. So this is a sham, basically. You know, from a climate change standpoint, it's a disaster. It results in a huge net loss of forest carbon storage and a massive increase in carbon emissions from all that increased logging. But it's also a disaster from a community protection standpoint because what it's doing, it's, it's selling a lie. It's selling a myth to the public, saying, we're going to double down on logging out in your forests, and we're going to somehow protect you from fire, protect the rural homes and communities from fire by doing all these logging projects out in the forest. What the science is telling us loudly and clearly is that the only effective way to protect homes is to help homeowners make their homes more fire safe, things like fire resistant roofing, rain gutter guards, so pine needles and dry leaves don't accumulate in the rain gutters where uh, an ember floating on the winds a mile in advance of the flames can land on the roof and roll down into that rain gutter, and exterior vents so an ember doesn't float into an attic space, things like that. Uh, that in combination with what we call defensible space, which is basically removing most of the small trees, shrubs, grasses, and then removing the lower limbs on the mature trees, but leaving those uh, mature trees in place. Doing that within 100 feet of homes in combination with these fire safe principles for the home itself dramatically increases the odds that a home will survive a wildland fire. And in fact, when this is done properly in communities, what we're seeing now is over 95% of homes surviving fire. The fire in many cases is just moving right through the community like water through a sieve, but the vast majority of the homes survive. However, if instead of focusing on home protection and focusing and directing our resources there, where we know it will save homes and save lives, if instead we're doubling down on backcountry logging and backcountry fire suppression and trying to turn back the clock to the mid 20th century, then we're not only going to destroy forest ecosystems and further threaten imperiled wildlife species, we're not only going to exacerbate climate change, but we're going to further threaten communities because you're basically giving people a false sense of security, telling them that this logging project out there way over the ridge somewhere has protected them. And so people think, well, I don't need to do my defensible space. Maybe they don't even know what that is because they weren't told how to make their homes fire safe. So I mean, it really is a very dangerous sort of approach. Uh, it's a regressive approach. And frankly, it's just a gift to the logging industry and you know the biomass logging industry in ways that are not consistent with the current science. Yeah, I see that type of just sheer insanity in so many resource extraction projects where the government and the large corporations are completely ignoring science and all of the studies that have been done over all these years. And it's really interesting because I think we need to look at that whether it's Governor Jerry Brown or the National Forest Service, they're looking at the forest as a commodity first and foremost. And if we don't understand that, then we can't really understand what's behind all of these bills that are trying to be passed, such as the Forest Carbon Plan. You know, I was even thinking about the Healthy Forest Initiative that was a political strategy from the Bush administration. You know, the notion that commercial logging is a preventative measure in addressing catastrophic fires, which is something that you've been debunking this whole time. 
But this policy garnered little attention because it capitalized on the belief that healthy forests are full and green, which again, that's something that you've been debunking too. So the forest carbon plan is nothing new in a sense. It seems like it's just a new spin on a forest mismanagement plan that's been happening for decades. And I guess I'm really interested in just hearing a bit more of the political underpinnings of some of the details of, you know, and I don't want to even ask why, because I know why is money, but how are these things even still being passed when there is so much science? Why is it that the general public either doesn't know about it or potentially just doesn't have the power to shift these types of large forest management plans, especially when it's in their county, their state? I mean, there, there just seems to be this major misconnection happening here. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. I think in order to understand how to change things, we need to understand how information is being misused and how misinformation is being spread. You know, back in the 1970s and 1980s, the Forest Service and the logging industry and their political allies, when they were talking about logging on national forests, including clear cutting, they would say, hey, we're doing this because there's money to be made. You know, the Forest Service makes money that sells public timber to private logging companies and pockets most of the revenue for its budget. The logging industry makes money. The politicians make money. They get campaign contributions off the top, essentially. And they would say, look, you know, we're clear cutting old growth forests because best thing you can do is clear cut that decadent over mature forest, which is what they called it back then, and plant a thrifty, fast growing tree plantation. You know, that was their worldview. You know, as you as you put it, they they looked at forests as a commodity. Well, you know, that hasn't changed, the, the fact that they look at the forest as a commodity. What has changed is the political spin. And that's really important to understand because, you know, by the early 1990s, the spotted owl became a household name and people were starting to wake up to the fact that their national forests were being destroyed for greed and, and economic motivations. Large areas were being deforested and clear cut and turned into uh, natural wild forests, turned into tree plantations and, and tree farms. And there was a large, large public backlash and people started saying, listen, we don't want our national forests logged. We want them protected. And the Forest Service understood that. The timber industry understood that. Uh, the prologging politicians understood that. So, But instead of changing direction, they instead changed the messaging. They Instead of saying logging, they say, oh, we're not logging. We're doing fuel reduction. We're doing restoration. We're doing resilience work. We're doing thinning. We're doing hazardous fuels work. There's all these euphemisms, a whole parade of euphemisms that are used to disguise what's really happening. But it's just the same old logging that's always occurred. It's just being presented or spun as a benevolent or benign activity. And we need to kind of see through that smokescreen in order to really change things. And, and I think, frankly, we also need to confront politicians and land managers and, and others uh, when they basically play into or disseminate that same kind of misinformation and those same kind of euphemisms. Yeah, I, I just when you had mentioned the word resilience, I know that back in November 2017, the House passed the Resilient Federal Forest Act, which increases salvage logging on federal properties. And Senator John Barrasio from Wyoming introduced the Wildfire Prevention and Mitigation Act to the Senate, which similarly would exempt logging projects and environmental law and public participation on national forests and prevent federal judges from being able to enforce environmental laws. So this has really been, it's, it's happening, you know, from so many different angles, so many different states, so many different national forests, state forests. It really is an attack on our public lands, an attack on our public forests. And I'm so glad that you're speaking to it in this way and really debunking these myths for us. Because for the listeners out there, when we do hear things like fuel reduction, resilient forest act, we need to look deeper. We need to understand who is behind this, who is making money, what is the purpose, and really look into the scientific research to see, is this actually backed by ecologists? And it's it's just, you know, it's like everything else in this time that we cannot take things at face value. And it's, you know, of course, it's disturbing to know that the government is spinning these myths to us so that we somehow think and I and just to even hear you say that it's sometimes being sold as restoration. 
I mean, it is really, really <sighs> subversive. So I, I so appreciate you spelling it out for us. I think we absolutely need to understand forest policy from this angle. Oh, I'm, it gets me all worked up. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the uh, what we call the Westerman bill that passed the House earlier. Uh, it didn't pass the Senate, fortunately. Uh, we fought it. A lot of other organizations fought it. And, um, you know, we had a sign on letter from hundreds of scientists that uh, fought back against it. But it is really, really important to understand because this is a, a piece of legislation that would essentially eliminate environmental laws on national forests nationwide and allow the most intensive, destructive kind of logging, including clear cutting of post fire habitat, clear cutting of old growth forest without any environmental analysis and with the most minimal public notice. And it's all packaged under the guise of forest health and restoration and resilience. The word resilience is actually in the title of the legislation. Resilience is a climate change term. And the lead author of this bill, a Republican from Arkansas who comes from a logging industry background, and many of the others who promote these, these bills, these are climate change deniers. These are people who, who proudly uh, proclaim that climate change is a hoax and they're spinning that kind of misinformation. Meanwhile, they're cynically using terms like resilience, climate change terms, to promote a rollback of environmental laws and a massive increase in logging in ways that would exacerbate climate change and destroy habitat. So we are pushing back against that. Lots of people are pushing back against it, and lots of people are waking up to these euphemisms and, and this misinformation and uh, calling their members of Congress and, and saying, listen, we want our national forest protected. We're not buying this. We want you to focus resources on helping people protect their homes from wildland fire within 100 feet of homes out there on the national forest. Let fire be fire. We don't have too much. It's doing important ecological work. And we should stop logging on our national forests and protect them, much more like national parks. More and more people are saying that and waking up to it. And I think you know that, that's a real message of hope. And I think also about all the carbon that's burned through these quote unquote restorative thinning methods and the machines. And like you were saying, the damage that the machines cause the forest soil and all the time it takes for the soy forest soil to rebuild and create the complexity with the mycelial webs. It's, I really wanted to ask you that question. And I'm so excited to hear your answer. And honestly, this whole conversation has really it's been enlivening. It's this topic I'm so invested and engaged in. So I've had just really the best time talking to you about this, but I would love to ask you one more question before we close. And I've read that you've been called a polarizing figure in forest policy, which I can see why. And, you know, you've gone as far as suing the Forest Service to stop salvaging operations. So I'd love if you could share with us how the John Muir Project and yourself are working to ensure that these managed lands are allowed to exist in optimal ecological conditions. Yeah, thanks. Well, you know, the John Muir Project is kind of a full service operation. We uh, we stand up for science in every way we possibly can. You know, we we go out in the field, we gather field data, and we publish original scientific studies, um, several per year, on these key questions about forest regeneration, about fire history, about wildlife species that depend, many of them, on post fire habitat. We do public education work and get the message out to the public. We educate policymakers uh, as much as we can. Uh, we get, engage in social media. The other thing we do is we stand up for environmental laws when the Forest Service misrepresents or ignores key scientific studies. You know, one of the things that the National Environmental Policy Act, what we call NEPA, requires basically is that the Forest Service and other land management agencies tell the truth to the public about the impacts and about the science. And if they don't do that, that can be a problem for them. Now, you know, it's difficult in terms of you know, enforcing federal environmental laws on national forests. The courts are required to defer to the agencies, to the Forest Service and other agencies, in terms of their interpretation of the regulations of the science. And so it's a very, very, very high hurdle. So you know, there's a lot of illegal logging going on out there that doesn't get stopped because of that deference standard. At some point, that's got to change. But, uh, but sometimes you can surmount that standard and, and stop uh, an illegal logging project. And we've done that on, on a number of occasions uh, through the John Muir Project, working with other partners, uh, including the Center for Biological Diversity, among others. 
in especially stopping these post-fire logging projects, you know, what the Forest Service calls salvage logging. And really, you know, it comes from what you mentioned earlier, that, that term salvage, um, that comes from their view that the only thing that's good about a post-fire area is what you can salvage economically from it in terms of value. And it really it just shows and underscores how much they're not seeing it as a forest and how much they're seeing it as a crop. You know, there's a, a very, very strong consensus in the scientific community that post-fire logging and all the associate, associated activities that go along with it, like the herbicide spraying of toxic herbicides that the Forest Service does after they clear cut this post-fire habitat and the artificial planting of trees, that that's about the worst thing you can possibly do after a fire. And so, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're standing up for the science in every way we can. And, and, uh, you know, on, on some of these projects that so we wish we could actually challenge more in court, but we do what we can with what we have. And, uh, we do stand up for the science and, and for the environmental laws as often as we can, uh, in courts, especially after post-fire logging projects. Well, thank you so much for your work and for the others at the John Muir project. I so respect the way in which you are working within the systems and outside of the systems and really putting a lot of effort into debunking these myths to the public that our culture is built on and the way that we interact with our forests and our natural ecosystems is built on are these myths, these um, these lies. And to see them for what they are, to understand why they're happening because of the economic value rather than the ecological value, which at the end of the day, ecological value is is everything. You know, we can't live on money alone. <laughs> we we really, really need to protect these forests for our own survival, let alone the survival of all the species who directly depend on forests. So I'm so with you. I really appreciate you and your work. And this has been a wonderful conversation. So thank you so much. It's been my pleasure. Anytime. Thank you for listening to For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. The music you heard today was by Itasca. The theme music is Silence Returns by Bo and Like a River from Kate Wolf. I'd like to thank our incredible podcast team, our producer and editor, Andrew Stores, our research collaborator and writer, Francesca Glassbell, media director, Molly Lebo, and music coordinator, Carter Lou McElroy. Thanks again, and until next week. Hi, this is Chad Hansen. Hey, Chad, it's Ayana. Hey, how you doing? Good. Thank you so much for talking to me so last minute, so late at night. And sure, I thought today just a, sh a couple quick questions about just the current sure. fire. So we talked a lot about forest fires and forest policy and honestly, just the ridiculousness of the rhetoric that's coming out and the myths about forest fires. And I want to get into what Trump is saying right now about the fires in California. But first, I wanted to ask you about what you think about the current fire situation happening in California from LA up to Northern California? Because when we talked even just, what, two weeks ago now, these fires hadn't broken out. So I'm really interested in hearing your outlook on the cause, what's contributing to these, and you know, what do you think can be done? Right. Well, we have to have two completely separate conversations about the effect of wildland fire on communities and the effect of wildland fire in wildlands. And they're totally separate things because the, the fact is, especially in forests and woodlands, we actually still have a pretty significant uh, deficit of fire in our forests. We have less fire now than we had historically. And so you know, we don't want to be putting resources into trying to further suppress fire because A, that's unnatural, um, and B, that takes resources away from protecting homes. So. We've always had big fires in California. We've had big fires in grasslands and chaparral. We've had big fires in forests or a combination of those things. 
you know, we actually do have too much fire right now in chaparral ecosystems, basically shrub habitat, lower in elevation, below the forest. And that's overwhelmingly because of so many human ignitions, accidental ignition, some arson adjacent to communities. And so we really need to focus on preventing unplanned human ignitions near communities and letting more lightning strikes burn without trying to suppress those fires in the mountain forests. You know, so ecologically speaking, there's nothing unprecedented about big fires in California. You know, the, the fires that we're seeing right now are not you know, record fires in terms of their size or intensity. But what is unprecedented is the effect, the impact they're having on homes and on lives. And that is something we can really do something about. So, I mean, there's a few things that go into this. You know, first off, Donald Trump's tweet over the weekend is so incredibly heartless and destructive because you know, first of all, most of the fires that are burning homes and, and costing people lives are not in forests in California or elsewhere. Most of the big fires where homes are lost and, and lives are lost are in grasslands and chaparral. They're in oak woodlands. They're in low elevation areas that are nowhere near a forest. And so this whole idea, this whole focus on, on logging, on forest management is really just a diversion to, uh, to really enrich and benefit Donald Trump's timber industry political allies and the political allies of the the GOP. So, you know, I think that's pretty cynical. But the second thing is, and this is something that is really key to understand, is that the areas that are in forests where we have big fires and where homes and lives have been lost, like we saw just days ago in the campfire in Northern California, those are areas where some of the heaviest and most intensive logging has happened anywhere in the state. So in the places that that minor portion of fires where it is in forest and lives and homes are lost, these are areas where that's happening not because of the lack of logging, as Donald Trump would like Americans to believe, but because of logging itself. And we published the the most comprehensive analysis on this ever a couple of years ago. We looked at millions and millions of acres and fire across three decades of data in the Western United States. And uh, what we found is the forest with the most logging and the fewest environmental protections, those areas actually had the most intense fires. And that's what we saw in the campfire. The fire burned through thousands of acres of area that had been heavily mechanically thinned, so-called, which is actually you know, pretty intensive logging. So that's what mechanical thinning is in most cases, and uh, in heavy post-fire logging on both public and private lands. And the fire just swept through that area really intensely and rapidly, and people just didn't have time to evacuate. So this whole notion that uh, the forests are are overstocked or overdense, and that's why fires are burning intensely, it's really the opposite. Mature forests don't burn as intensely as forests that have been heavily logged. So, you know, in a sense, we're talking about the relationship between fire suppression and people building their homes on fire-prone landscapes. And so for people who do live near these really degraded forest, heavily logged, like you were saying. Is it something where you believe that people shouldn't be rebuilding their homes in these areas? Or do you think that the defensible space is something that even would work in this time when the land has been so degraded? Yeah, it it always helps. It always is a very significant factor. You know, the most important thing is the materials with which the home is constructed and basic steps like fire-resistant roofing, ember-proof vents, so those flaming embers that are driven by the winds a mile or half a mile in advance of the flames that they don't get sucked into an attic space or some other exterior vent, rain gutter guards to prevent dry pine needles and leaves from accumulating next to the roof, you know, simple things like that. I mean, it makes a huge difference, even in extreme fire weather, but we're not going to get to 100% with that. And the fact is, is that we know now that there are certain areas that because of topography, because of wind patterns, are much more dangerous than other areas. You know, we didn't have those data 20, 30 years ago, but we do now. And so I think we need to use that information to inform future building. And there are probably some places where we shouldn't be building at all. And there are other places where if people are going to build there, they need to basically build out of material that is just simply not going to burn, like steel houses, for example. You know, most steel houses are, have a very, very high recycled content and it's you know, non-combustible. So, you know, I think that there are a lot of things that can be done. The problem is, is that people still have this notion that the problem is out there somewhere in distant wildlands. 
And if there's a fire, some agency is going to step in, state or federal, and they're going to stop the fire. They're going to suppress the fire and save the town. And you know that's a dangerous falsehood. The reality is you just cannot stop weather-driven fires, not with giant air tankers that drop giant amounts of water, not with logging, certainly, that only typically makes them burn more intensely. But even the places where they just thin really small trees and Sometimes it can burn a little bit less intensely in those areas. It still burns right through those areas. It doesn't doesn't stop the fire. And so, you know, all those policies are dangerously misguided. And we just have to focus on homes. Yeah. The Trump tweet over the weekend saying that the national forests are mismanaged. They need to be cleaned up. You know, no talk about climate change. No talk about weather-related fires. So there really is this myth and miscommunication that's happening. And I think that's really dangerous for the fate of these areas and for the fate of the future people who will either go back and re-inhabit or inhabit new areas that potentially are dangerous or not being built in the right ways because we're not really talking about the issues. Yeah, that's right. We have to talk about climate change when we're talking about any of these issues. Because the fact is, is that fires are driven and influenced overwhelmingly by weather and therefore by climate. And climate is influenced by climate change and human activities, both fossil fuel burning and logging. And people forget that logging is the second largest cause of climate change. And forest protection is one of the two key things that has to be done in order to mitigate climate change, in addition to moving beyond fossil fuel consumption. And so Donald Trump's tweet over the weekend is sort of doubly insidious because, number one, it's dangerous for communities because it takes attention Uh, and potentially resources away from focusing on creating fire-safe human communities and instead focuses attention on logging operations on the wildlands. But second, it essentially denies the role of climate change. You know, that's something this administration has been doing from the beginning. And there's a big difference between forest fires and suburban urban fires. I just think about, for instance, breathing in the smoke of trees and duff and plants material versus breathing in horrible toxins from Walmarts burning. And you can imagine all of the stuff on the shelves, all of the Windex and paint thinners that are burning up in the air, all of the insulation, the toxic chemicals that are used for building these days. And then how that the smoke comes up, we're breathing in the smoke, it's extremely unhealthy. Then it also comes down in form of ash on our agricultural lands, in our watersheds. Not to mention that there was talk of a, I think, chemical company that burned up in Southern California. So what are your thoughts on the fact that so many of these fires that are burning right now are not forest, but instead these heavily toxic man-made chemicals that are burning up in the air that's filling our lungs and the lungs of our more than human kin. I think that's a really good point. And, you know, it just emphasizes you know, all the more why we have to focus on structure protection, communities, homes, but also commercial structures within communities and adjacent to communities. And, you know, the reality is, as you point out, you know, some of these areas are in forests, but others are in chaparral or grasslands in Southern California and low elevation areas that are nowhere near forests. And we have commercial buildings burning. We have hardware stores burning with all kinds of chemicals that are being volatilized and going into the air. If we focus on protecting structures, if we ensure fire safe communities, both residential and commercial, that's not going to happen. We can safely coexist with fire. We really can do this, but we're going to have to move away from these 20th century myths and superstitions that have been driving our fire management policies and encouraging us to look out there over the ridge and think about the problem as being the threat as being somewhere out there in the wildlands. And it's not. It's right there in the communities. And that's where it has to be addressed. And that's what you were saying earlier in this brief conversation we're having is that in these suburban urban communities, there's some type of human combustion plus weather related fire issues that are combining to create these fires. That's right. Yeah. I mean, there are all kinds of things that that are highly combustible in human environments. In fact, you know, if you look at a lot of the imagery that we see coming out of a lot of the fires, you'll see a, a house that's burned down and it's on fire or it's already smoldered down to ash. And you'll see that the trees and other vegetation next to it 
that are, you know, slightly singed, but otherwise green. You'll see homes that are burned down to ash with a green lawn. And that's a circumstance where those homes are burned because they were ignited by embers. In many cases, in fact, most cases, the homes are, are not uh, burned because they come in direct contact with flames. They burn from embers that are floated by the winds in advance of the flames and land on something combustible, usually a human structure. And the human structures ignite the vegetation around it or singe the vegetation around it. I mean, that's what's actually most combustible in a lot of these areas is the actual human structure. It's not the vegetation in many cases. So basically, one spark in a heavily populated area can create a massive destructive fire because of all of this material that's just ready to combust. Well, it can, or it can basically be nothing at all. I mean, a, a community that's well defended, where these principles are applied throughout the community, can experience thousands and thousands of embers being driven by the winds from a fire that's nearby through that community and not have homes burn or have very, very few homes burn. Or you can have one home that has a vulnerability because something was missed or because they didn't do their fire safe work or whatever, and, but the neighbor's homes won't burn because they're properly defended. And, and that damage is very much minimized and contained. You know, that's the way it can work. And we know it can work that way because we have numerous case examples of real fires, real towns, where these principles were taken very, very seriously before the flames occurred and the vast majority of the homes survived. And we know that. We know it works. We have scientific studies on it. We have case studies. And we know what happens when that's not done. And so I think, you know, again, it, it really just comes down to this choice that we have to make as a society. Are we going to listen to the voices of fear and cynical opportunism like Donald Trump? Or are we going to pay attention to the science and actually care primarily about people and human lives? Mm, thank you so much, Chad, for having this follow-up call with us with such late notice. It really means a lot to us. And thank you again, Chad. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye. You too. Bye.